Good morning, my dear. How are you? I am good. All the better for seeing you, <laughs> as the um, wolf might have said in certain stories. <laughs> <laughs> are you going to eat me? <laughs> no, I, I'm very much about rehabilitating wolves and our relationship to wolves, so of course I'm not going to eat you. <laughs> of course not. <sighs> Yes, and hello to everyone listening and joining us today. Um, today is a special episode because we actually have no plan whatsoever. Usually we decide, at least maybe on the tale that one of us is going to tell. And today it felt like, okay, let's see. Let's tune in and let's be attentive to what wants to be told and what wants to be talked about. And I, for one, my dear Cara, um, I feel like talking about snakes. Oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> snakes have definitely been um, featuring large in my life the past week or two. Um, yeah, my daughter has just moved home and she has several snakes that live with her. Um, and they are all fascinating creatures. I find it interesting because when I was a teenager, I really wanted to have a snake. It was my ambition i guess to have a royal python because i just thought they were such cool creatures and of course i didn't have the space or the time or the patience to really own a snake and do it properly um so i'm quite glad that i didn't have the capacity at that point to have a royal python and um, because they are a big commitment i mean they live 40 years so they are not a pet that you can take on lightly so she now has four snakes. Yes, I was going to say five, but I think it is only four. Um, she has um, six vivariums because she's also got a couple of um, lizards. But yeah, the snakes fascinate me. Um, she's just finished a summer working in a small zoo. And part of that was working in the animal house doing handling sessions for members of the public. And she said that every single time they did a handling session with the snakes, all the stereotypes would come out, all the little things about, oh, it's slimy, or is it going to bite me? Is it poisonous? Which, of course, she hates because they're only poisonous if you eat something. And of course, if you eat a snake, it's not going to kill you. If you were bitten by a venomous snake, that could be different though. So there's how we use words. And she said that even when she let children particularly, but the adults as well, whenever she let them touch one of the snakes, they would stroke it. They would feel the scales, those beautiful, soft, glistening scales, and they would still say, eh, slimy. And snakes are not slimy. They are dry. They are smooth. They have got the most incredible scales on them. And she finds them endlessly fascinating. Um, when she was a small child, she was desperate for a pet. Um, and I quite well, I wanted a dog at that point, and I thought having a dog would be good. But my partner at the time was very reticent to get any sort of pets um so we compromised on something that was going to be indoors that wasn't going to take so much time so she was offered the choice between a snake or a rabbit and she thought about it for about an hour and decided that she would much rather have the snake because it seemed so much cooler um and it's interesting these days she doesn't find rabbits interesting at all and she is very glad for her choice and is quite an expert on them now actually wow okay how's that for a conversation starter <laughs> seeing any snakes lately <laughs> um what, one thing that always comes up for me I, I i haven't been exposed to snakes much um 
uh, and I think this probably in my psyche, there's more of the old stereotypes locked in because I haven't been able to interact mm -hmm. with snakes as much. Um, but one thing that comes is is the question of keeping them in an environment that is fulfilling to them. Because anything that's, you know, in a, in a box, in a glass house, in a is is a cage, isn't it? Or or is it? I don't know. Um, so yeah. can you share about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it is a cage and there are some snakes that are much better, better suited is not the right word. There are some snakes which tolerate a domesticated environment much better. So many snakes have particular areas that they stay to. They like small spaces, they like caves, they like to feel enclosed because then they're not going to be attacked by predators and so on. So there's a lot of snakes. For example, she's got a royal python, which is by far her heaviest, largest snake. Yeah, as she says, um, three out of the four snakes that she owns are bigger than her, taller than her. Um, so the royal python is the biggest. Um, and she has an enclosure which is not overly large but you never see well you don't see her out very often she doesn't i mean she uses the space she has two different caves and a piece of bark that she can hide under she's got substrate that she can um, burrow into she's got branches that she can climb she's got vegetation and so on that she can um, crawl through and hide behind and so on um there are different ways. I mean, I'm no expert on it. She is the expert on that, but um, you can have bioactive enclosures as well, where you have the whole biodiversity. You have a mini ecology within the vivarium, which makes a huge difference. Um, and that's something that she hasn't got a fully biodynamic um, enclosure set up for them yet, because it does take a lot of preparation. I mean, to build an ecosystem, I mean, we we are struggling in the world at large to build ecosystems or just to sustain the ones that we have which nature is already maintaining to so to actually introduce one is hard but yes the types of snakes she have have all had a long history of interactions with humans royal pythons for example are called royal pythons because they were worn in parts of Africa as a symbol of royalty. So if you were the king or the queen, you would wear a royal python. You wouldn't wear it skinned and turned into some leather object. You would wear it as a live living creature around your neck or draped over your shoulder or something. And it was a symbol of your power because snakes have so much power. They're connected to the ground. They're connected to rebirth. They're cr connected to renewal and in some ways divine right to be part of this world or something mm. Mm -hmm. thank you for that yeah wow yeah it's definitely a field that that i'm i'm not very familiar with except for the snake's connection to the great mother to the goddesses to to the divine feminine which of course is ancient and um it, it, yeah, the the one goddess that I remembered most strongly uh, was Hygieia, of course. I think we talked about this in in another episode a while back, and the fact that uh, the the goddess Athena Hygieia can be traced back to Crete, and there's a there's statuettes that that have been found there of a beautiful woman uh, holding two snakes, and she's dressed in a in a seven layered skirt, and and yeah, she's she's a snake goddess, and she is the mm, the origin or the source for the goddess Hygieia. And on Crete, they had these these um, rooms in the cellars of buildings where they would keep snakes and feed them and and uh, look after them um, as a warning system, because snakes pick up on yeah, on on any disaster that's approaching, such as tidal waves or earthquakes or fires, volcano eruptions, whatever, um, and the snakes then fled the building. And when the snakes left the building, people knew, okay, we have to get the heck out of here. Um, and I thought that was so amazing. And that's just one one example for an anecdote where the snake 
was held in highest esteem in pre-Christian eras. Um, and it's so interesting what you described in the beginning of how how our reaction has been so implanted um, into our, our subconscious that doesn't have to, anything to do with the reality. So that the snake's skin is dry and beautiful, but the reaction is, ooh, it's gooey and slimy and yucky. Um, and that's just something that's been planted. And that's something I find is often the case with with goddess work, with with um, feminine archetypes, with goddess stories. Is the first reaction isn't born from the present moment, from what the person is actually experiencing, but it is caused by a story that has been told to us for about three thousand years. And so, yeah, here we are, right in the middle of another episode of What of the Ground we're standing on. Indeed, and that ground we are standing on does have snakes and in the spring they emerge. I mean, our local glen here, um, every end of March, beginning of April for the last few years, myself and my two children have gone for a hike up into the mountains because that's the time that the snakes come out to breed, to fatten up for the year and to breed. And the ground is literally crawling in them at um, this point in the year. And it's so fascinating to go up and see other hikers reactions to them because it's quite often nice sunny weather. People are going out for the first time with their families, dogs running here, there and everywhere. Not that it's a busy place, but there's enough people to, to notice them. And suddenly there's all these snakes everywhere. Um, and some of them are venomous. Um, so we have the adder. Um, and unfortunately, if the dogs go chasing after the adder, the adder will try to defend itself. I have to say, having been there several years and having very close encounters with adders, including accidentally almost stepping on a couple, they will not try to bite you out of anything. I mean, they, they don't want to bite. Why would they want to do that? They want to get away from any predators as much as possible. Um, they only use their venom <clears throat> for catching their prey and they would only use it in defense as an absolute last st stage um so we do get cases of dogs particularly being bitten every spring by adders but that's because the dogs are chasing the adders and then picking them up so you can't really blame the adder for doing that but yeah that emerging from the ground i mean the ground we are standing on and the fact that snakes have for millennia been associated with the earth with rooting us to place to being part of the cycle of birth and death and rebirth the fact that they come out in the spring you see them over the summer and then they begin to disappear and then you don't see snakes over the winter in the northern part of Europe, certainly in northern latitudes, because it's too cold for them. They're cold blooded creatures. They only warm up when the earth warms up. They cool down when the earth cools down and so on. So they are very, very connected to the soil. And, and we have this planting of modern culture, society, religion, perspective, power, all the rest of it on top of them. Um, I was listening to The Flowering Wand by Sophie Strand the other day, and she has a section in it where she's talking about Merlin. And of course, Merlin is this forest boy, the boy without a father and so on. And he fulfills a prophecy in that this tower is being built and the tower keeps falling and the tower keeps falling and the tower keeps falling until one of the wise men says, ah, you have to sacrifice a fatherless child and then you'll be able to build the tower. And so they find Merlin, who is the fatherless child. And Merlin goes, what? Why would you kill me to build a tower? Don't be ridiculous. Have you found out why it's falling? And they dig down and they find a nest of snakes. And the what Sophie was saying in her discussion about this story was that the snakes very much represent our old cultures, our nature, 
our connection to the earth and so on. And the tower, this erection, is literally a symbol of power that is being planted on top of the divine feminine, the mother earth type spirit. Um, and of course it was crumbling because you were trying to build it directly on top. And then, of course, you've got um, the famous quote that there are no snakes in Ireland. I don't know whether we want to get onto this at the moment, but St. Patrick is credited with one of his miracles of driving all the snakes out of Ireland. And this can be seen again as an allegory that when St. Patrick started to convert people to Christianity, he was in effect driving the earlier pagan religions, the earth-based religions out of Ireland and therefore everybody converted to Christianity and there were no snakes in Ireland anymore. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I had not heard of that. That's amazing. And also um, what it made me think of is, is the the correlation between snakes and the changeability of the feminine. So you could say that with every cycle, a woman changes her complete self. We renew ourselves over and over and over and over and over until menopause. <laughs> and, and the snake being an animal that's able to shed its whole skin. How amazing is that? And how, how terrifying, perhaps, to any, any system that wants to gain power. Because if somebody's able to shapeshift and change themselves completely out of their own strength and power, it's very hard to control. And uh, yeah, and I've been, I've been working deeply with um, the archetypes, the psychological archetypes of the six Olympian goddesses because for the next year I will run a year-long course again and it will focus on those six um, and it's so interesting to see how the one the one great divine feminine force whatever you want to call it the great mother the, the you name it but the one energy um that used to be at the core of the old societies has been split up in so many parts. And so it cannot renew itself properly because it's constantly trying to reassemble itself first. So you've got, for example, you've got um, Athena, the businesswoman, the society woman, the one with the focused laser mind, battling with Demeter, the, the mother, the the nurturing essence, the, the, you know, I want to build a home, I want to raise children. And those two are in battle because we we haven't been taught that they're all present within us, but they're one, they're one whole. And I don't know where I'm going with this, but it, it, it seems to me like part of the prop or part of the hindrance in creating a, a wonderful, free, prosperous, thriving new world order <laughs> um, is that fact that the feminine psyche has been split up in so many parts. And the snake is, is I think, is one of the guides, or that's, that's how it feels to me right now, is, is one of the guides leading us home. Snakes have been so demonized, I guess is an appropriate word to use. And understanding the snakes, I mean, for me, I think serpent snakes were probably the first of the creatures that we really othered. So we have this idea of the Descartian philosophy of othering ourselves from the environment. We are us and that is them. And we know that us and them narratives are very destructive. They lead to conflict, they lead to war, they lead to misunderstanding, they lead to the fact that we feel that we can have dominion over whoever the them is. 
and I think snakes were possibly one of the first animals, one of the first natural symbols. And I think because the snakes were such a powerful symbol in, yeah, Greek, Egyptian, um, so many ancient cultures, it was the one that particularly power the Roman Empire, for example, wanted to drive out um, because it was a real sign of resistance. Because as you say, if you have the symbol of a creature that can continually renew itself, that they can shed its skin and become something stronger, more bright, more glistening and so on, that is a definite challenge to power structures and to empire and to ways of control and so on and all the rest of it um so yeah i think there's a big thing about that snakes are also yeah i mean that that ultimate symbol of renewal i think is just so incredible i mean what you said about the feminine as well and the fact that as a woman most of us bleed every month from puberty to menopause and it is that cycle of renewal it is that connection to the earth and again that has been demonized in many ways over the years i mean we, we can cite some examples and i think we probably already have so that is fine um but yeah it's that symbol of renewal that power that connection but it also leaves us vulnerable we are in pain we are unable to complete certain tasks because of how we're feeling snakes themselves when they are shedding and the few days before they shed they go blind and they feel very very vulnerable and it is a very difficult time so that rebirth and that process of birth and rebirth is difficult birth is difficult every time we renew ourselves every time we have to deal with some major change it is difficult it is painful it is hard death is another change and that is hard and it can be painful and all the rest of it and that is why we fear so many of these changes and yet something refreshed renewed comes out of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've always been impressed by this image of a snake having to sort of wedge itself between two rocks or two just two surfaces and then go through there to shed so like to to find to find a place that seems too tight <laughs> and to go through and that is for me is a powerful image for growth and for mm, my higher self overcoming my ego because it's the higher self that drives me to go, okay, I need to shed this skin. I need to shed this old story. For example, I've been sharing this with you, Cara, but the for the past few months I've been I've been in the process of a of a business coaching. And it's it's a <laughs> it's been an investment that would have been impossible for me a year ago because of my mindset. And I would have found all kinds of excuses why I can't, why I'm not able to find that money, why blah, 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 blah. And now here I was and I felt, okay, I, I need to shed that old story. And the moment of that decision was highly uncomfortable. I was very, very scared or part of me was scared. And I decided to do it. And it feels like I'm now more and more shedding an old skin of lack of of self-perception that, oh, I'm such a poor whatever. And um, and also old, old stereotypical stuff about being a woman in a man's world and all these, all these weird stories that at the end of the day, I am telling myself. And I love that image of, you know, yes, let's have some snake power. Um, and, and the second thought that I had was yes, vulnerable just before the moon time for example um, um very thin thin stretched thin uh but at the same time i've read uh, a while ago i read that's that old societies honored that time because it was perceived as a service to the whole community 
And I found that very interesting. When women bled, they did it, or so they 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 perceived it, for everyone. They cleansed the whole community's energies. And so it was absolutely clear that in that time, during that time, they would they would have everything they need, they would be kept warm, they would be kept safe, and everything. And that has really changed my own perception of that time in the month. Within my family, for example, or towards my partner, it's not just, oh, here I go again, and the hormones, and yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I am actually cleansing the whole energetic field through my body. And so I have I have a right to then have a look at, okay, what do I need during this time? What can I do? What can't I do? Um, yeah, and that's been that's been an interesting journey for me. Yeah, that sounds very powerful. And that cleansing of energy, that shedding of skin, that change. I mean, I think they're related in some ways. Um, I mean, going back to actual physical snakes, I mean, when they shed, indeed, they do need rough surfaces to scrape across. Um, it is not an easy process. They don't just easily slide. Well, most of them don't. And if a bit is left, this this is the bit that I guess is what came up for me while you were talking was if a bit of the old skin is left behind, if it doesn't shed completely and a bit of the old skin is left behind, it sticks and it can cause irritation. It can potentially even start to rot. So tails, if they are unable to shed their entire skin, they are vulnerable to that actually just beginning to fester and beginning to rot and some of them will unfortunately sustain deep deep wounds because they haven't managed to completely shed and i think that's the thing in society now and what we are experiencing if we don't completely shed a lot of these stories they are still there we still have bit little bits of them attached to us and they will start to spread that whatever it is that energy that isn't helping to move us forward um so yeah i think that complete shedding and going through that pain and that agony of transformation in some ways is incredibly helpful and i love that image that actually yeah the the monthly bleed is a way of clearing energies it gives time for reflection for movement for yeah grounding us back to the earth um yeah, I mean, we've talked at some point, we've said that we might do an episode on menstruation, um, which I think would be fascinating as well. So maybe we'll get to some of these things then as well. Um, but yes, I think so much connection to that cycle of rebirth. And trusting that the new skin is going to appear. It's really interesting. I talked to my mother this morning and she's in a in quite a challenging process. I mean, she's 75 years old, yeah? So there's a lot of stuff that has been embodied that, you know, old belief systems, all that kind of stuff. And she's in a process where, where her body is telling her that she needs to shed a particular skin. But the fear and the distrusting of okay there's there's going to be a new skin on the other side it, it is going to come back it's going to be even better it's going to be stronger um that is is keeping her in a stranglehold at the moment and it's been it's been yeah i I've, I've been <laughs> been cheering her on from the sidelines going you can do it mom um but there's only so much you can do and that the process of shedding these skins is entirely our own and I find that image of the snake incredibly helpful just now, just to remind us that this is how it works. And it, it it's a cycle. It's not a linear process. And if you look at our own skin, I mean, we renew our entire body every seven years. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's common knowledge by now. And yet I, I, I think we still haven't grasped the miracle that that is. My, my teacher, um, John Croft used to say it's like it's like the story of my grandfather's axe we've replaced the handle three times and the blade we've replaced like four times but still it's grandpa's axe and that seems to be 
such a great image for how, how life works, how we work. Um, and we think we've got it figured out, but we don't. <laughs> That's an interesting comparison. So yes, it is still the grandfather. Is it still the grandfather's axe? Well, no, because the grandfather did he even touch the blade or the handle. Who knows? But I think for me, we mentioned this at our storytelling event a couple of weeks ago. Um, the idea that when we shed our skins, we still get to take our old knowledge, our experiences. We are still at root who we were when we were born. And in some ways, the shedding the skin is getting back to that. So it's not that we're losing parts of ourselves. I loved the um, comment about, yeah, your mother and trying to shed that skin and it's difficult and we don't know what's on the other side. And I think life stages particularly are really hard. Um, and when we lose something, so as we get older, I mean, I know myself, I've had various bouts of illness and things. And it's the accepting that perhaps you're not going to be able to do something or seeing yourself in a different way, shedding that skin and so on can be really hard. But when you get to the other side, you're actually, you find other things that perhaps new gifts that you're given and so on. Um, and that can be very special. Yeah, I have a few friends at the moment that are struggling with really severe illness, um, life limiting conditions and so on, disability. And they found that actually the process of accepting, well, not accepting, but moving into that new state of being and finding what their new power is, has been a painful process they are still them but they are also different they have changed they have had to shed that skin of expectation that that sort of ableism that we have in our society about the fact that everybody can do everything all at once that no matter what we're feeling no matter what time of month it is no matter who we are we can be it all we can have the perfect career and the perfect relationship and the perfect friends group and do all the rest of it and actually, one of the skins that we learn to shed as we experience life is that we don't have to do it all. We don't have to live up to all those expectations anymore. But that is a difficult story sometimes to shed. Um, yeah, going back to the story workshop, actually, that we did um, a few weeks ago, I made a comment that one of my affirmations that I'd written several years ago was the fact that I am made mother and crone in human form. I am all at once. I am layers upon layers. I was the maid. I was the mother. I am learning, hopefully at some point, to be the crone. So these are all parts of me and they are all essential parts of me. And I have to shed some of the expectations as I go through those stages. And yet I keep the distilled knowledge, I would hope, of each of those stages with me. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Knowledge makes me think of wisdom. And wisdom for me is the connection or the, the, the link between snakes and dragons, because that to me feels very related. Um, and I keep I keep thinking of um the method of dragon dreaming which uh, I learned over a decade ago and which is a um, a way of building community and of building sustainable projects and it is based on the idea that we encounter dragons at the end or edge of our comfort zone and Western society has an image of killing that dragon, you know, St. George and, and all the rest of it. Whereas older societies view the dragon as a symbol of luck, as a, as a being of infinite wisdom, as a, an amazing friend. And so dragon dreaming turns this Western distortion back to let's dance with the dragon. Let's get to know it. Let's befriend it. And it goes back to the wagu, which is the the uh, Aust or original Australian rainbow serpent. 
And uh, John Croft, the founder of Dragon Dreaming, brought this method or developed this method with a lot of input from original peoples from Western Australia who he worked with and he brought it over to Europe. And when he came over here, he thought, oh, nobody knows what the Wagyu is. Okay, let's call it Dragon Dreaming. Um, and uh, my journey with that method and way of thinking has been a very deep one. And I think it's the, it's, it's, it's the one thing that set me on this path I am on now, wanting to rebalance the divine feminine and masculine wanting to aid as many people as I can to to start dancing with their dragons instead of trying to slay them or ignore them or run away from them. Because dragon power, serpent power, gets us back in touch with the with the cycle of life, with the fact that we are infinite, with you know, with immortality, if you want to put it like that. Um, so that's yeah, that's just one thing I also thought about. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. I think, yeah, I'd love to hear more about Dragon Dreaming, actually, and how you used it as as a method, perhaps. Mm. Yeah, so it's 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 three three things. It's it's a method for sure. So you can build sustainable projects with it, but it's also a philosophy, and it's about mm, building community personal growth and being in service to mother earth and any project anything that you're doing that that has these three core values can be viewed as a dragon dreaming project and the method is very special i feel because it has something that other regular project development tools do not have and it is it is split up in four stages so it's, it's it's circular you go in a circle and it starts with the dream it starts with the dreaming phase and that brings us to the original peoples of australia the dream time which for them or what which they say is reality right that 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 place where everything is possible where everything is connected that's the reality and we drop out of that reality into linear time and a delusion and then we go back into it when we dream for example when we sleep uh and then we come back uh and it starts with the dream and if you have a dream you share it and you make it somebody else's dream too you invite them into your dream so for example i i think a year ago now I wrote you an email saying, Cara, I feel we should <laughs> we should meet. We need to meet. And here we are, a podcast series and all kinds of stuff happening. So I had that that dream perhaps started in me. I shared it and now it's our 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 joint dream. Then you go on to the planning stage, which of course is quite familiar to many people in 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 today's society. Um and there's there's lots of tools for each stage as well. And the, the planning stage in Dragon Dreaming is very playful because John was very aware that the planning stage is where, where many, many dreams die <laughs> because we over plan and it becomes so serious and so heavy and we don't, you know, it's not fun anymore. And then you move on to the doing stage, of course. So you implement, you, you actually do your thing, you do the project, you record the podcast or do whatever. But then comes what is the most distinguishing thing in Dragon Dreaming, the celebration stage. You celebrate what has happened, you celebrate what you have achieved, and it is a celebration in the sense of honoring. And it can be honoring of success as well as the honoring of pain. And that is something that Western society is sorely lacking. We rush from, okay, now we've done it. Okay, what's the next vision? Okay, let's let's plan it. Let's do it. Okay, what's the next? Okay, blah, blah, blah. and we do not pause. There are no pauses. And when I learned that method, that cha it changed my life. It was the first of many, many big changes in my life. Uh, yeah, there's a lot I could go into. Um, but that that fourth stage 
is vital. And it's about, you know, eating well, having a party, but also about mourning, about grieving, about, wow, it didn't work out. Why the hell did it not work out? It hurts. <laughs> and to share that celebration. And each of the four stages really make up 25% of the project's time and budget which is quite revolutionary because most people, when you go, okay, I need 25% of the project's whole budget to celebrate, they are going to, yeah, look at you like you're mad. But this phase makes the difference and just determines whether your project is going to be sustainable and able to run for many years. And it doesn't matter if it's a big project or if it's your everyday life, that fourth stage is the factor that, yeah, that has blown my mind because it really works. I love the idea of celebration and ritual as being really important because it is really important. And that's one thing that I think often we lack and it's the community celebration and the, the rituals that connect us with others. So we mentioned it, this idea before about othering other people, other communities, other habitats, landscapes, nature, all the rest of it. And rituals used to be a way that we connected. We would have rituals to welcome the salmon home, to um, talk to the geese when they were flying back overhead as part of the migrations there were these cycles that were in tune with the year and we still have celebrations but they're much more individual they're much more personal family all the rest of it is not so much to do with the community or the wider natural community anymore and i think that one thing that we really need to look at in healing ourselves and our connection to the environment to the community, to the universe itself, is to bring back some of these rituals. So I love that idea that actually 25% of our budget, whether that, whether that is in time or energy, whatever, should be focused on actually the celebration phase. Um, I mean, the American um, writer, Kurt Vonnegut, he has a whole series of essays on, well, is, isn't this nice? And the fact that actually you have to celebrate the small moments, you have to celebrate the joys as they come, because, well, what's the point in living if you don't? It is such a huge part of who we are. So since we started the conversation with snakes and with your daughter and your experience with snakes, maybe you would like to sort of round us off. How, how do you feel about the topic now after all this conversation, all these <laughs> alleys that we went down? It's been interesting watching her build the vivariums back up. So like I say, she's only just moved them back in. She's not got proper biodynamic um, setups yet, but she ha does have deep, deep substrate. And the corn snakes particularly, they are burrowing creatures. They love just digging into it. And there are these tracks going here, there and everywhere. And I think we have gone here, there and everywhere. And yet there is still so much to explore. Um, I think with every topic that we touch on, we are just touching the surface of the ground and then dipping in every so often to pieces. So I think we've, we've yeah, we've looked at some topics. Um, snakes are one of these things that we do have so many stereotypes and culturally layered attitudes towards. And some of our older stories, I think, take us back to more of that connection but also they have their own layers on them that as storytellers i think it's our responsibility to try and strip off to take those skins of the last two three thousand years of culture but how can you do that? Because we are not the people that we were 3000 years ago. We don't understand the connections and so on. And so every 
cycle has to be a new cycle and we have to tell the stories for the moment that we are in. So I would like to have the opportunity to rehabilitate snakes just as I'd like the opportunity to rehabilitate our relationship maybe rehabilitation is the wrong word to renew our relationship with animals that we demonize um we have a list of creatures that people are scared of and perhaps they are scared of for good reason in some cases but also we have lumped everything together as them so spiders and bats and foxes and wolves and snakes all these creatures crows that people have attitudes toward that are all culturally mediated um, we need to examine those skins. Did we shed all the attitudes towards them? Or are we shedding the attitudes towards them that are causing harm to ourselves and to them? We haven't told any stories yet. Go ahead. All across the Mairns, that farmland in the northeast of Scotland, Travellers have come for centuries, in waves. They arrive in the spring and leave in the autumn. They are here with the crops which they help to plant, to pick, to harvest. And one year, a young woman arrived with the group of travellers, and she was beautiful. The farmer noticed how beautiful she was, and even though she was heavily pregnant, he wondered. She seemed to be on her own, and so he started to spend more time with her. To bring her drinks, to bring her bread, and they'd sit and they'd talk over lunchtime. And he asked if she had somebody special, somebody that she was perhaps in a relationship with. And when she said that she didn't, he asked, would she consider maybe staying with him? Well, over the course of the summer, they had got to know each other well, and as the time of her birth, the birth of her child was approaching, she agreed, so long as he would commit to being a true father to the child. And he agreed, he readily agreed, and when the girl was born, she had the most beautiful green eyes and dark hair, and he loved her. He loved her instantly because she was beautiful like her mother. And they were so, so happy. And the girl grew up amongst the fields, helping with the planting and the crops, and helping her mother bake to make the family home a beautiful place. And after a few years, she was joined by a brother, a little boy who took after his father so much with his blonde hair and his blue eyes, and he laughed like the sunshine, and where his sister was dark and brooding wherever she went, she kept to herself, but she noticed things. He was outgoing and vivacious and talked to everyone. They were like the sun and the moon, and they loved each other so much. Wherever they went, they went together. And as they grew, the daughter's beauty also grew. Until one day when she was fully grown, a man came to the village and he saw the daughter. And he came to the house and asked if he could court her. Her brother took one look at him and instantly disliked him. He disliked him with every fibre of his being and he could not understand why, and he especially could not understand why his parents allowed this man to court his beautiful sister. And she seemed to be enamoured with him as well, and he was so confused. Could she not see how dangerous, how vile this man was? But no, she put on her most radiant smile. She wore her most beautiful clothes. They went out 
on walks and talked and laughed and she seemed to giggle and become silly in front of him. And he could not understand why. Why was his sister doing this? He was quite anxious and angry. And at the end of the season, the stranger asked to marry the daughter. And she laughed and giggled and said, oh, I would love to, but I am not yet ready. Come again next year and ask me then. And so the stranger agreed and left for the winter. And in the spring came back and wooed her once more. And again, her brother was so confused every time this man appeared. She would giggle and simper and wear her finest frocks and become a different person. She was so wise and so connected and so much fun when you got her on her own. But she never had outward expressions like this. Something was wrong and he knew that something was wrong, but he couldn't figure it out at all. But this man was dangerous. This man was not what he seemed. The season wore on and by the end of the season the man said, now will you marry me? And the daughter smiled and giggled and said, of course I will marry you. And he said, good, then you will have to come to the woods with me. And so they were married and the daughter packed up her few possessions and from with the hugs from her parents who had been quite charmed by this man. She left. But her brother wasn't going to take that. Her brother wasn't going to let her go off with this man that there was something wrong with. No, he sneaked out of the cottage and he followed them down the track. He followed them at a distance down the winding track and into the woods. And as night fell, he listened for their footsteps as they got deeper and deeper into the woods. And then they stopped. They stopped and the man put down his bag. The man put down his bag and he took off his skin. And underneath, he was a bear, a big, fierce, enormous bear with claws that you have never seen the likes of before. And he turned and he swiped at the daughter. He swiped at the daughter as if to kill her. And the daughter, she, to the amazement of her brother, shed her skin. And there, underneath, was a snake, the most beautiful snake he had ever seen. She was black and lithe and tall, and she rose up in front of the bear, and she hissed. And they fought, they fought the most almighty battle, and in the end, with fear in his heart because he was so worried for his sister, but in the end, she defeated the bear. I'm not quite sure what to do. The brother approached and he said, sister? And the sister put her skin back on once more and turned and looked at him and said, brother, I have not been able to tell you, but my father is the king of the snakes and I I've spent my life here waiting to protect you all. This man, I knew from the moment I met him that he was evil, that he was going to destroy our village. His plan was to marry me, to get me out of the way and then stay in the village and wreak havoc here. And I had to stay to protect the village and I knew I had to defeat him in some way. And now I have. I am going back to my father's land to learn what it is to be truly one of my kind. 
and I want to tell you before I go that I love you and that all danger is past. So go back to our parents and tell them that I am happy, that you saw me on the road with so much love in my heart and maybe one day I will return. But let them know for now that all is well. And with that, she picked up her bag and travelled off into the night. He returned to home, knowing that his sister was safe. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> So yeah, it is a story I've only heard once and it's not one that I have sat with yet, but I was totally charmed by it. Mm. So may all listeners sit with this story and yeah, just see what, what images come up for you, what information the snake magic has for you and I think that's it for today. Um, wishing you all a wonderful time. May you be blessed. And we're looking forward to recording the next episode for you. <laughs> maybe with more of a plan, maybe not. <laughs> Who knows? It's been quite an episode. Um, I'd just like to say anybody that is listening, as soon as the episode comes out, um, which is probably not very many people, we're going to be doing an online storytelling on thursday the 24th of november so please join us you can find details in the show notes and on each of our pages so thank you and the event is going to be called wild winter tales so grab a cup of tea and join us take care and we will speak to you next time